You're now listening to the Check 2 Studio Podcast with your hosts, Austin and Trevor, bringing you the latest in video marketing and production. Here we are, Austin. Wait, you, there we go. You That's know it. where we are? Um, what do you mean? Like, where are we <clears throat> spiritually? Where are we physically? Where are we at with our business? No, I don't mean talk- any of those things. What where you- we are is we are now in double digits. That's right. Episode 10 is now here. How excited are you? I've been all around the past and all around the future and all around the afterlife. And the best place to be is here. The best time to, to be is now. Yeah, you've been working on that one? Uh, yeah. It's right. just yet another in a long series of a diversions in an attempt to avoid responsibility. Well, today I am real excited because mm. we're going to cover an awesome project, one of our very first projects, and it's a beast. It's our very first documentary on Bob's Bicycle Shop uh, right near in our hometown. So I don't know. We got a lot of thoughts on this. What did you think before we ever started it? And just the idea of taking on a documentary. Did you think that we would be doing that in our first few months? This is the this is the job that made me have second thoughts, made me rethink my life. And uh, I cried many nights to sleep. <laughs> um, yeah, so this was our first... <clears throat> we had come together on, on some minor things that were really your jobs or my jobs, where it's like, hey, you know, do you want to come on and help? But this is really our first job under our new business name when we started where we're like, Hey, we're 50, 50 partners and we started ideal impact media. And this is the first official ideal impact media job. So, um, yeah, it's, let's just jump right into it. It's a 15 minute documentary chronicling, chronicling the 50 year history of a historic bike shop in our town. That's got a very rich history, a very tumultuous past, if you will. And, uh, it, it was quite a beast to cover all of it. And the owner had, he wanted every little bit of it in there. You know, if a hurricane so much as farted on this place, he wanted it mentioned. People needed to know about it. Uh, well, and, let's and, see that intro. I want to uh, see the intro. I want to, we're not going to go through all of it because it's 15 minutes. We'll go through bits and pieces, but I want to see that intro. And just to preface the intro a little bit, we used it, we made the intro kind of like a trailer for the piece anyway. And we used the first. 30 seconds of this as a trailer before the piece was done to get people excited. So I think it's fitting to start with just the intro and we'll go from there. Trevor, are you ready? I'm ready. Are you holding on to your butts? I'm holding on. All right. Oh, bridges. Nash riders. Yeah. They're called cyclists by some. Cyclists. Okay. This is a Saturday morning ride. I think I found me. My dad showed me about the mechanics of a bike. He took me to a bike shop, and it was Bob's Bike Shop. Some more drone shots. <gasps> oh, man. That's really the intro right there. Wow, that gets people excited. They know the name. This is a very popular place, like you said, 48 years. And we had to dig into that history. I had some connection to this shop through my parents, and I'd been there many times, but I really didn't know. The owner is kind of a soft-spoken guy, even though a lot of people know him, and uh, and some of that history was not as obvious. And so when I had done a little bit of work for one of his events, and, and if you watch this full piece, you'll know that events and community involvement is, is very important to him, and I recorded some of that. I made a short highlight video of it, and because of that, he always had had it in the back of his mind. Maybe a documentary really telling the story of Bob's would be fitting. And he saw some of the work that, as Austin and I were coming together, and he had us in for a meeting, and and that's where things started to take off. So I really want to talk about that process. What are your thoughts? Yeah, and I had actually, um, I had kind of gotten into the the hobby of cycling, but gotten out of it. I only stayed in that hobby for about a year or two. Um, so I had actually gone to the shop as a customer before, before too, but it was a farther away shop than most of the shops that I frequented. So I, while I did know about it, um, and I liked it a lot when I went in, like I thought like, wow, this is a real bike shop, but it was far away for me. Um, um, just going in. So we had a lot of challenges on this shoot. 
Yes, and we do. I'm going to get one of them right out of the way, right right off the bat. Right out of the bat. <laughs> it the the bike shop is called Bob's. Nobody named Bob works there, nor has anyone named Bob worked there. There's a lot of people with B in their name. And or a lot of three letter names like Rod, the owner, the current owner and the really the the main focus around this that for which this documentary uh rests the um and even you know we had to broach that in the in the documentary because it's one of the big questions for people that go to the shop they're like hey and it's such uh such a prolific confusion that when people go into the shop and say hey uh is bob here somebody will just be like yeah i'm here i am i'm bob here you go today i'm bob so um for you know, that was one of the big challenges because, and just to, to say it as fast as possible, the person that opened this shop was involved with it for a very, very short time within the, the first year or two mm-hmm. of the shop's history where, you know, none of the crazy stuff that eventually occur- occurred that that's going to be really fascinating, really good human interest didn't really happen in those in that first year when the actual Bob owned it. However, the shop did re- re- uh, retain the name. The Marquee Bob's Bike Shop. So that was something we had to get out of the way quickly. We couldn't dwell on it too long. Because, Who is Bob? Right. We couldn't dwell on it too long because that's, like we said before, that's not where the human interest lied. Um, so um, to kind of play out the, the plot here without going too far, the main <clears throat> heart of this story was really between uh, the second and third owner of the shop. The second owner's name was Bill Armstrong. He owned it for a majority of the shop's life. And he kind of had this father-son relationship with a with a kid that started coming into the shop named Rod, who eventually became part owner, and uh, through the, the the long history, eventually became the full owner, and now is the one who carries the mantle, so to speak. He is that that story. That's the human interest story. That's where this story sits. That's the heart of the story. So any of those prior things we had to kind of gloss over and get in as new documentarians if you will we never shot a documentary before this we really didn't know what we were doing we knew there was a story there and we had to tell it um so trevor i'm gonna have you chime in on on that like how did we what made us think we could even do this i don't know drugs maybe caffeine i'm not sure so yeah i want to talk about you kind of laid the groundwork of what is the story and as much as people really uh, need to hear on, on this side of check two studios of the story. I think you laid it all out there. What I want to address, as you mentioned, is we had to uncover this story. And that took a lot of conversations with the owner, Rod. And it also took a lot of conversations with other people who hopefully would know some of that history. Unfortunately, there wasn't a lot of people other than Rod. And his thoughts were not always linear. <laughs> and when you are creating a documentary, you want to have some understanding of the facts because people expect it to be true. Although uh, Mark Twain tells us, "Never let the truth get in the way of a good story." And well, there, uh, lucky, lucky for us, not to to jump in on you there. This um, there was a lot of real human interest here. We did not have to fabricate much. The only the only the only liberties we took were really in the timing to to kind of show like you know. Um, some of these events take place years and years and years apart from each other, but we've got a 15 minute documentary to, to tell. And so some of the things it, it seems like, wow, all this stuff happened, like, but really it's a 50 year history. So really the only liberties we took were kind of making things kind of condensing the story down, but we didn't fabricate any of it. Um, I've got a great piece of uh, behind the scenes photos here. Yeah. So wait, before you pull up and I, I think I know what you're going to be pulling up. I don't know. We, you. we, we had to, from a business perspective, be able to make ends meet. We weren't expecting to make money on this, but we wanted to at least have a budget that we could make it as good as possible. And you have to have a certain amount of information to do that so that you can have a plan and then ultimately you can pitch ideas and then ultimately you're gonna have to execute on those. And uh, and we had a pretty good way of doing that. That was your idea. So bring that document up and, and how we use that to go through that process. Right. And you were dead on, by the way. You knew exactly what I was going to bring up. And just to um, preface it a little bit more before I bring it up, um, you said that we needed to have information and we need to have an idea and we need to have a strategy to tackle this. Mm-hmm. But I also wanted to show... Um, I wanted to show that we had been working because this was this was after our first discovery meeting 
And I wanted to show the client at that, hey, we went home and we really tried to digest all the things you told us. And we wanted to show um, a good faith effort, I'm going to call it, that we wanted to do this. And this is our this is our little documentary. And I remember we sat in an earlier office, not this office, we were down the road. Mm-hmm. And we were there uh, on, and we went into one of the conference rooms, had a projector and we had computers and all that high tech stuff. And at the end of the day, what I, you know, I wanted to be able to grab things and and you, you, you know, me, I'm very much, you know, I want to have a less of a high tech and more of a high touch. So I I wanted sticky notes and I was sticking stuff because I felt like I could really rearrange things. I didn't want to click on anything. I want to grab a sticky note, move it around. And we were trying to make a three act structure structure. And so we had all these different, uh, um, ideas for the story, all these different, um, <clears throat> what do you call them? Concepts, events that are going to happen. And, um, and for those who are listening, what you're seeing is a whiteboard, large three foot by two foot whiteboard it's put into three sections, say act one, act two, act three, and then post-it notes where we just started with grab a post-it note, write an event on there. And we color coded them to some degree, things that were negative or, you know, created fear or doubt or, or unhappiness. That's why you see um, most of the red happens there in the middle. Hmm. Tell us about we, that three act. Well, um, as much as an amateur as I am when it comes to that, you know, I, I, I kind of look at it like Star Wars, right? You've got Star Wars, Luke's on the farm, right? So he's kind of coming out. He's 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 realizing there's this whole new world. He learns. He's like, "What's the Force?" Obi Wan tells him, "Oh, you got to learn about the Force." And uh, so basically, his world gets bigger, right? He he explores. And in Empire Strikes Back, he he maybe finds out things aren't as great as they seem, and he gets his hand cut off. And it ends with Han is trapped in carbonite. And it just really doesn't end on you know the happy note like like the first movie did where they're 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 getting awarded for their bravery at the end of the first movie. So the second one ends kind of sad. Then in Act Three, all story points uh, converge. They triumph against evil and uh, bring the whole thing home. Well, how how can you know ever ever in you know how can you make how can you apply that to every story? Well. you just have to kind of take all these little chunks and not all of this made it into the final piece. Um, but going by that, uh, going by that structure, we focus around Rod because he's the one who we have the most access to. Uh, He's the one that currently owns the shop and he is the client. Um, and he found the shop at an early age. And so we have this first, very first story point finds Bob's. And if you remember from the intro, the very first thing Rod says is, well, I think you found me. Then, you know, maybe that's kind of, you know, uh, that's a little bit of a, what's the word, sophistry there, you know, whatever. But he gets a point across, you know, he doesn't really remember he was a kid, you know. And he went in there and the owner did kind of find him. He's like, hey, we'll put this kid to work. He's here. He's hanging out all the time. So moving right along, uh, Bill teaches Rod, you know, about cycling. So we got Bill teaches Rod to ride. Um, Bob opens. This was just, you know, some something that was, uh, you know, we touched on briefly um, support rides. That's something that, uh, Bob's does for the community. So all these things are things that he mentioned and we wrote them on sticky notes and then we went back and figured out how to put them into the documentary. So not everything made it in. Some things are briefly mentioned and also other things that aren't on here might've been added in. This is a very early organization of our thoughts. And we have down here by buys Bob's because, uh, Rod, uh, and Bill, Bill bought rods from Bob uh, and Rod bought Bob's from Bill, where they were joint owners at a time. Either way, it gets com- complicated, and you guys can watch the the piece if you're interested. So then we move into Act Two. Now this is where things, this is where our arc happens. You know, maybe oh, Luke's now he's he's left the farm, but he's finding out that this big new world might not be as bright as he thought. Okay, so let's take a look. Uh, uh, Bill and Rod butt heads. So you know, while <clears throat> Bill brought Rod on as a kid, and he eventually became part owner. They had a lot of disagreements in how to run the shop, and they got in a lot of fights. Um, there was a Corvette that crashed into the shop. That was a big event and is kind of uh, one of the bigger subplots in the documentary. And it didn't just crash into it. It crashed through it. Well, it destroyed the, it, the yeah, shop. It, it destroyed, destroyed the shop. Yeah. And they had to basically go back and, you know, it's a completely different building now. Dangers of Riding is one I, th- I think that got completely taken out. 
because at the end of the day, this is kind of an advertisement also for the shop. It wasn't really meant to be, but we didn't want to be like, oh, you shouldn't, you know, if somebody's looking into buying a tennis racket or a bike because they want a new hobby, you know, we don't want to talk about maybe, maybe the tennis racket might be a little bit safer. I don't we, <laughs> e- needless to say, we, sh- we shied away from that one. Um, yeah. And then, uh, spoiler alert, Bill uh, eventually passed away, and that's why it left Rod as a full owner of the shop. So we did broach that right at the end of Act 2, kind of setting off the same way, you know, Empire, going back to our Star Wars structure. And, you know, Han is in Carbonite, you know, the Luke's hand is cut off, the galaxy, you know, the Empire kind of comes back, and he's a, is the winner. So it's kind of the, the darker of the two acts here. So, no. But this is a good illustration. Can you read that? I can't read that. Um, oh, internet, internet retail, retail competition. We, we yeah, didn't I wrote touch that. that. The things that you can't read are your handwriting, and the things that you really, really can't read are my handwriting. So, yeah, that's what it looks like. But the, the physical object and being able to create the story, and also in the sales side and planning, is is instrumental. So, I think this is really cool. We actually brought this in. We didn't even bring the whole physical piece. We actually only showed the picture um, as we were going through it, but. You know, there was a lot of other planning that went into how we were going to be able to price this in a way that we could affordably create it and conceive it. And the biggest thing we learned is, you know, really be careful of assumptions that you make and even things that the clients tell you is going to be easy. I'm not going to say that clients are going to try to mislead you, but... Well, they don't do what we do. Right. Their their thoughts on it are very different than our thoughts. And say, oh, they have lots of photos and videos and it'll be easy. And then, you know, I can, you know, you can use that and all you have to do is basically get interviews or get a voiceover. Or that was our ideas. You know, oh, you have all these photos and videos. We can just get a voiceover or a few interviews. Maybe we'll get some people riding their bikes, wrap it up. No big deal. It didn't work out like that. (laughs) Not at all. We ended up doing a lot of extra days of shooting than what we had planned. Um, I think the final piece turned out great, but, you know, always, I think that's lesson number one. Projects get larger and larger. Also expect the risk to go up, and the things that you think aren't a big deal are, are going to end up being a bigger and bigger deal. Um, so the other the other thing is we had a couple of pivot point ones down here. So we had, you know, we came out of the, the happy act one the, the world broadening section into, you know, Bob's in turmoil. And that's why we have all these things that cause, uh, that were dangerous mm-hmm. to the shop. And then going into act three, where we're kind of bringing the whole thing home where everybody triumph triumphs. We'd call them that a new day. Cause they Corvette had destroyed the shop and they got it rebuilt with a little help from some insurance. Yeah. It's not and, exactly uh, linear. No, but like I said, that's, that's where, that's where we took our liberties. And I think if you're trying to make an honest documentary and you're trying to show the drama, I think that's one of the places where, you know, you shouldn't feel too guilty if, you know, if you're going to have to make some changes, I'd say start with the, um, the order of the events, the, the chronological, you know, mess with basically mess with the timeline first, because then you're not saying anything that's not true. You know, you're just organizing these things into your, your three-act structure. If you just say, you know, if we just put all these things on a timeline for actual dates, it would have made no sense. Like, oh, this happened, and this happened, and this happened. And it shouldn't be this happened, and then this happened. It's it not should a news be, story of facts. It should be more this happened, therefore this happened, therefore mm. this happened. Or, you know, this was a flow where, you know, you kind of organize it in some way. You know, if you if you drop all this on a timeline with actual dates, it would have just been... It would have read like a dictionary. It would have been terrible. Um, <clears throat> so, um, you know, that's basically how we, we structured it. And uh, w- what Trevor was alluding to before was that, you know, we bit off maybe more than we could chew, maybe more than what should have been budgeted for the project. When I first When we first pitched the project, I thought it was a ton of money. Like, wow, we're getting paid a lot. But, we're going to be getting DeLoreans by the end of the week. Yeah. Um, I had our, yeah, so basically, you know, but then as it kind of drug through, it's like, it's like a dollar an hour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's about <laughs> and, right. And, well, it wasn't that bad. I, I mean, I still, I'm still happy with, uh, I still think we were paid appropriately. Mm-hmm. I think that a lot of, and, and here's the thing, to have charged a client more than what we charged might not have been fair because a lot of the reason it took so long was a lot of um, inconsistencies in our workflow. 
So it would have been, you know, we would have been charging him for our inefficiencies that we hadn't worked out yet, working as a team, setting up interviews. These are things we were learning. Had we charged him more, you know, for our own inefficiencies, I think would have been maybe not the best thing to do because he, you know, basically would have been paying for us to, to mess things up and whatever. I think it worked out great for everybody involved. I think it worked out great for them. I think it worked out great for us. And we're still, uh, we're still working on a lot of lessons we learned on this shoot, yeah. both um, in in the way we organize how we do things um, and mistakes we made with the image. Cause I think some of our, some of our interview lighting, this is early work for us. So I think some of the interview lighting, we still were blasting hair lights. Like, <laughs> Oh yeah. I want to start to dive into some of these shots. Okay. I'm going to get rid of the, this. Yeah. Uh, I, before we go forward, I actually want to go backward just a second and talk about something that was probably a little sketchy. Let's go back to the the bridge and getting those bicyclers, mm. cyclists, as you like to call them. There we go. So, um, I did not call them cyclers for the record. Cyclers. I called did them I cyclists. Cyclists. So this shot obviously is just people, you know, riding by us. But I'm talking about the next shot. We where we are on their level on a one lane road. Well, two lanes, one going each way. And we are passing them on an island. So that green, that's the island. Over here. Yeah, the the cyclists are going to be going around that corner. And basically in the next shot, we are in a truck. Uh, first behind them, then passing in the lane that the traffic's going the opposite direction in. And then eventually we are in front of them. So let's take a look at that. This is a great two-bridge shot, by the way. So we got this nice bridge over here. Yeah, the there. double bridge. So... Um, this shot is the very next shot. So I was in the back of my pickup truck with you driving. What were you, what were you holding? I was holding a June crane with an a 6,500 and I was standing in surfing in the back. And now, um, I think that they average around 23 miles per hour on this ride. These front guys here, they're, they're not, uh, slouches. I think when I used to cycle, my average speed would be around 18, 19. Um, these guys are faster than me. Uh, who knows? There's a lady right there too. She's keeping right up. Oh uh, yeah, make no mistake. There's a, look at this guy. This guy's old, dude. This guy would put me in the ground on a bicycle, dude. Um, I like I said, and also, um, you know, they ride more. I I I, I don't do it anymore. I was it was a hobby for me that was short lived. Yeah. Um, so here's a shot. So we kind of pass them. So let me see what happens here. My dad showed me about that shot. Yeah, so it was a very qu a... quick shot, but it had to be quick because I was driving in the opposite it's a two -lane direction road. of, <laughs> yeah, you can see it a little bit to the, you know, the yeah. side there, their left. I grew up off right. this road. Um, this is tropical trail. So we, you went, f <laughs> you know, going around this very long in that, that shot. If that you look Peloton. at the, yeah, now you're, now you're getting the lingo. Yeah, hey, I've known the lingo. So I think maybe in this shot you can actually see. My dad showed me. No, because they're separated. You know what also so happens is packs break off. These are the front. Yeah, because it was in the beginning. So like the fast people will break off. So the only person broken off at this point was my mom. She was on the way back. Because your mom. Everyone else was with together. A cycling. Okay. Okay. So as as uh, as Trevor said, we we were dangerously did this yeah so be careful when you're out on the road and you're getting trying to get that great shot that you think is going to be so epic it was worth it in this circumstance but it was very very close to not being worth it because it was pretty dangerous you need to rent the russian arm to do this the yeah. arm car but yeah right you took me so to a bike a shot, shot and it was a bike shot. okay so, so let's talk about that hair let's light. talk about it let's talk about that hair light. what is happening we actually thought we were all pro in this situation because we turned all the lights off in the shop. We signed, shine this blue light on all these bikes back here. We, we keyed him up and then we put that hair light on there and we said, turn that hair light all the way up. How about to another good documentary? Just turn that light to 11. That's right. That was a mockumentary. You which, mean that wasn't real? Spinal tap? Oh, it's real here. This is a little bit later. We had kind of cooled it off. It's a, a little bit. better, but it's still a little overcooked. It's, well... I mean, you got some clipped hair there. He needs to get some clips on his hair. So this these are these are true. These are not 4K punches. These are actually two different angles. Two camera setup. Yeah, it is. 
to okay. what would later be his life's work. And they got sick. Oh, this is one of the things that drove me nuts at the time because I was coming out of, you know, I was filming lots of weddings where I was getting tons of really pretty images. And the thought of making this documentary and taking old photographs or even old video clips and putting them in to something we were putting our name on was frustrating to me. And I was afraid what people might think. They're like, oh, did Austin think that's a great photograph right there? <laughs> you know, and I didn't, you know, I just wrestled with that a little bit. And in the end, I came to terms with it and I said, you know what? We need to get this done and get the rest of our money. Yeah, well, you know what also <laughs> drives you nuts? What's that? That this is a photo of a photo that we didn't even take. No, nope. Cowboys butts. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's keep moving. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. He hanging around, so they put me to work. And so I just started sweeping floors, and and then I saw bikes and repair stands. Okay, so we don't need to hear all this. So no. basically, we, we let's talk about what we did. We gathered a ton of interviews from a ton of different people. We got this guy. We got this guy. We got this lady, we got him again, and uh, I think, and then the, uh, the, that guy right there. Some more photos. Look at this shot right here, dude. You ready? Watch this. Oh, man. And this is where the story changes also. I took well, that. it's I part took of this, act two. I took this photograph. But it was a little unsettling. Yeah. It fit. You, you, that It's true, because there's a... Uh, that's act two. Yeah. So um, as we told you, there's all these things. There's this Corvette crash, and we had to change the mood through the music. And we had to transition these things, too. They didn't really, you know, they couldn't just bring one thing to a close and the next thing open. No. Some stories continued on. And because um, part of the drama is that Bill Armstrong dies of cancer in this documentary and that is kind of rod's mentor and like i said at the beginning that's kind of the heart of the story is you know the relationship between these two while they fought and had disagreements but then they also cared deeply for each other as well so there's you know like any relationship <clears throat> you know there's complexities that exist there but you don't die of cancer you know overnight you you know it sometimes can happen very quick sometimes it can take a very long time in this case it took over 10 years, I think. It was more than 10 years right. from yeah. diagnosis to treatment. So that complicates diagnosis our... Diagnosis to being deceased. Right. So uh, that's what I... Yeah. So it took him 10 years to die of the disease or longer. And that complicates our story because it means that every every event in here, that kind of looms over everything. Mm -hmm. And because he had had it so long, a lot of time, a lot of the people had kind of gone into denial that it was ever going to catch up with them. They're like, oh, he just, he manages the disease, you know, kind of. And uh, we're looking at some footage here, if, you know. Before you move on, I do want to talk about the editing process because so much of this was in stages and it was shot and edited over a long period of time, kind of fitting pieces together. Mm -hmm. You know, and I remember some late nights trying to get these pieces together with all the other stuff we had going on at the time. Tell me about that editing process in your mind, trying to keep everything straight. And what lesson did you learn through that that you take into your workflow to address in future projects? One of the things that at the time when I was – every time I would get something that worked, I was very resistant to change it because I was like, I just got this together and then we'd go talk to Rod a little bit more and he'd be like, well, you know, this kind of happened this way or this needs to kind of happen. Or we would decide like this kind of happens in between. And I would wrestle with that internally. I'd be like, well, I've already got this together in a way that kind of works. I would not want to change it, even if it would make it more accurate, because it's like, well, what if I can't get it back together in, in a fashion? And now when I'm editing, like uh, we just did, um, we had to make some adjustments to another project today. And it was, I just... I learned that, you know, it's like just drop it in and massage it. So I, today when I made those changes, um, there was a part of an interview that, that the client wanted us to add in. I dropped it right in and I started moving the B-roll around and kind of, you know, I found the right place for it. And it would have gone a lot faster had I just said, look, drop some clips. Okay, just get the clips that need to be there. Drop those clips. And, um, you know, it would have gone faster and it would have, you know, I wouldn't have spent so much time have an anxiety over like, oh, I've got to add this piece and I don't know if it's going to work. And I had just gotten it. I just kind of got this flow going. 
So, um, you know, if, if you're super nervous about it, you know, copy the project and then, you know, open up a new instance of it and start dropping clips and start getting in there and get your hands dirty. It's the only way it's going to work. Mm -hmm. If you, if, you know, if those changes absolutely have to be made, I think in the back of my mind, I was secretly hoping that, you know, just be like, okay, we'll leave it out or, you know, okay, well don't do it. But really, you know, you just, it's all about dropping clips and been able to just dig in. And that's a good point. I also wanted to talk about um, the music selection. Let's talk about how a project that's 15 minutes is going to have three or four pieces at least of songs and and really digging in. So what do you use to source audio and how do you make decisions on that in order for it to match and move the story along? With our budget on this project, the only uh, music source that we could really go to is Soundstripe because we had a subscription. And... Soundstripe, um, while, you know, like uh, Musicbed and some of these other options are, you know, allowing you to actually get in and change the structure of songs, remove instruments, do this and that, um, I didn't have that. So I would have to break songs up. I would have to find, like, the bridges to the songs <clears throat> and kind of loop them to make them fit, like, the whole time because sometimes the, the cancer story might have gone on longer than the song would allow for, so I would have to cause looping and crossfades and... You know, it was a nightmare. If I could pull the edit up right now, I'd show you. But, you know, just, just imagine, like, splicing all over the place and then moving one song into the other because, like you said, the mood changes. So we had sadder-sounding songs and happier-sounding <laughs> things. And it just, you know, making all that work, really, the whole thing, eventually, it just becomes like Play-Doh in your hand. You just kind of mold it, you know. Once you reach a certain point, once you kind of get in the zone... You know, you just get in there and massage it into place, and that's how we did it. Unless you've been shooting all day, and then you're editing for six hours, and then you're listening to songs, because then you go crazy. I remember, like, so you, you, I know what you're trying to make me do. <coughs> I would get, I would find these like instrumental songs, and to, really just to make Trevor laugh, I would add lyrics to them about the project, <laughs> but also because we're delirious from the long hours. And, uh, you know, that's just a hallmark of mine. Back in the day when I used to play Nintendo, I used to sing made-up words to the songs. Some people have made a very successful living on YouTube doing that now. So I'm not apologizing for that, Trevor. I'm just not. Listen, it's great. It helps us, uh, you know, really bring the story. It really ties everything together when hopefully everything's already shot. We start to get to some music and uh, flesh it out. And I start singing lyrics to the, that's to right. the songs. That's right. They don't make it into the final cut, though. Not yet. Future project. That's going to be one of our, you know, podcasts. Here's something we can talk about. Screen recording. Even though we're doing it right now for the podcast, it's the first time I've screen recorded something to put into a video. And uh, this is in the third act after, you know, the shop's kind of had, it's taken on its new life now. It's the, the third act. They're triumphing over life. They are believing and achieving. They got to see it, to believe it, to achieve it. And uh, one of the things they wanted to do, one of the things that was important to them was they wanted to go green. And this is a, a readout of their solar array that now exists on the, the roof of part of their shop. And uh, they have a readout of it. There's the solar panels. I'm just going to play it. Solar panels to help power the store. So uh, I went in and actually on I his computer where that readout was, I actually recorded, screen recorded uh, all that information and then... Uh, saved it, sent it out to my computer so we could drop it into the edit. I thought you logged into that from your computer. Is that what I did? Well, yeah. we did it. We did. It. We were at the bicycle shop when we did it, right? We were yeah. at. Okay, so maybe I signed. Maybe he gave me a login. I don't remember, but I did screen record this and drop it in. I do believe Rod is carrying on Bill's <laughs> legacy. Music. But it's not just Bill's legacy. I'm not saying it's it future. We're excited well because he added so much. Bill provided the, the, the groundwork, the foundation, and the, the premise of... This is Bill's brother here that we're listening to. You know, um, if you remember back to school, when they teach you your five-paragraph essay format, what's mm -hmm. the last one? It's the recap, right? It's yeah. the conclusion. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I hated it in school. hate it now, but hey, I had to put it to use. Yeah. Because... Um, while I don't really fancy myself a writer, when you're doing a documentary, you kind of are. You're you're at least a curator of these ideas. Yeah. 
and uh, you know we do our research, and this is basically a video essay of the of the shop. So. <clears throat> Yeah, and that comes down to the planning. Like, if you're not going to sit down and write some of these things down, it's going to be a disaster when you get into the edit. But there's another challenge. You're not using your own words. You've got interviews, so you have to find what you want to say through, you know, their story. So we're mm -hmm. using him as the mouthpiece for the story because he's, he, you know, we basically, you know, when we record these interviews, we don't know if everything he says, you know, if the first word he says is going to end up being, you know, the last sentence he says in the documentary and, you know, vice versa. You know, we've got to curate all these ideas and it really is a daunting task. And my hat is off to, to documentary filmmakers that are making feature length documentaries. You know, they spend multiple years on these things and a lot of time they're doing it as a labor of love and hoping that they can sell the thing when they're done. Good job, guys. You guys are amazing. And I'm learning that more and more as we do things like this. In workmanship, uh, excellence, and customer And he's service. kind of where you know we're using him and a few other people. Rod, here for forty-eight years, and and you'll probably see us for another forty-eight years as well. And this is like kind of like our little recap, talking about the bright future. And then we have credits. We're both yawning because it's. It's late. It's late tonight. We had a long day of work. You had a long week of work. We've got a long week of work ahead of us. We got a nice little Easter. Rod and Sarah, best wishes on your wedding day. I hope you have many years of happiness, decent kids, and Sarah, I'd like to thank you for keeping Rod away from the buffet before the guests had a chance to eat. Good luck to you. And that was the only that was the only shot of Bill Armstrong speaking in the whole thing. That's the only footage we had, and that was actually from Rod's wedding video. Mm -hmm. So we, we had to also take that and get that into the thing. And, you know, that was kind of like a post-credits. Rod's wife just about lost it when she saw that because yeah. she uh, she wouldn't even watch her. She won't watch her wedding video because of all the people that she's lost in it. So it's very sad. And she didn't know that was coming. And I remember her running out because we premiered this in front of a live audience. Yeah, and I do want to talk about that I do premiering too. it. You wouldn't believe we had. Look if how I full. The, look how full the chairs were. There were so many people so excited. <laughs> Who is this young man, Trevor? <laughs> that is my son Atlas, just waiting. He, look at his shirt. He loves. Is that by design? He loves Austin's videos. He's always asking me, "Can we watch the paint suit? Can we watch <laughs> Madam Liability?" He's always wanted to see all the work. I He's remember he it. said. At the end, he said, good job, Dad. I don't think he said that. He did, because I think your mom said, go tell your dad, good job. <laughs> okay. I think you're frozen, dude. <laughs> so the premiere, when we actually showed this, and, and that was one of the big goals, it wasn't just to put it online, it was actually to have all the people who are involved with, that have been involved with the store for a very long time, um, frequent customers, people who go to all the events, to watch it live. This is a big thing about this bike shop, and that's also what sets them apart from just buying things online, is this is a place to go to make friends, to become a better rider, and have a real community. And for us, that was very exciting, because being able to premiere your work in front of a live audience is amazing. So this was some photos that my wife took as we were getting ready to show it on the big screen, and that also came with challenges. Um, I don't know if there's a photo where you can actually see the screen. I think there is. This is the audience looking in awe. I don't think it's actually started yet. This is some of the pre-roll. <laughs> <laughs> he loved it. And unfortunately, he got cut. He fell asleep during the interview, too, <laughs> I want to say. He was a really nice guy. I yeah, know. he was. Um, so is there, where's the it. shot where it shows the back? I found, I found a shot of the screen here. I'm just trying okay. to get it to come up. Uh, there you go. That's what it looks like. So there's the other side before everyone showed up and come in, sit down, get to see the screen. So this shot, this is kind of a wide angle lens. It's kind of far back, but the screen's bigger yeah. than it looks and everybody's sitting right up there under it. Uh, you want to go into the nightmare we had connecting into the sound system? Yes, I do. So we're used to same day edit. Not that we've done a million of them, but we've done a handful where you're showing it at a live event and, and things go crazy. But we know that preparation and having backups for certain things is super important because if it can go wrong, it will go wrong. We had come, we'd done a sound check, we'd made sure everything was looking as best as it could. 
and they Rod even bought a new projector for this event to make sure it would look as good as possible. The projector worked great. The projector worked great. However, the sound system was Bluetooth. And when we tested it, we only tested it for a few seconds because we could change the delay on VLC. Right. Or VCL. I can't because remember there was what it's a uh, VLC player. So it's a latency. Right. So we said, okay, well, we know that Bluetooth is going to have a slight delay, but we can use VLC to correct for that. But what we did not anticipate was that the delay was not constant. It was very, it was variable and intermittent. So even though we would set it, it would then eventually either the Bluetooth connection would gain strength or lose strength or whatever it would do. And it would, it would either become more delayed causing our, our, uh, conversation to then not be right. Or it would become less delayed. And then the conversation was no longer needed as much, but needless to say, um, I'm not going to be burned by that again. And I didn't, I really wasn't super excited about the idea of it to begin with, but you know, we wanted to premiere it and he had the time slot and we didn't have a lot of time. And, uh, at least with a live performance, you know, it's gone. Like, we, you know, it's, it happened. Anybody that watches on Facebook, there's no syncing issues. And I don't think that it really mattered. I think a lot of people came for the free beer, as you can see here. And, uh, what's that guy's name again? Rick. Rick. Rick's hand there. And uh, he's wearing that awesome Molly Hatchet shirt. I remember talking to him about it. I'm pretty sure that's what I'm looking at in this photo. I'm like, hmm, I'm probably going to talk <laughs> to him about that. That's a sweet shirt. What's, what, so, yeah, and we had our, our popcorn here. You see I've got my laptop there, and we're both nervous and excited at the same time. This, this guy here, this guy over here, they know they're in the documentary, so I'm sure they're, you know, I'm sure there's some form of uh, – nervousness going on stage fright for them even though they don't have to perform they know they're going to be up on screen talking so i'm sure everybody's excited and they uh i don't think rick got to see any of it so until he watched it yeah. bill over here he he did get to see it so he knew what he was in for so and this is uh the the brother of the owner that had passed away so yeah i'm sure he's awaiting some uh emotions too and despite some of the challenges and, and frustration with the you know, the, the latency issue, people really enjoyed it. And after the event, it was pretty late. We went across the street to another barbecue restaurant, not our favorite barbecue restaurant. Not Criderman's. Not Criderman's, but it was pretty good. In fact, we ate there multiple times while we were working on this project because it was right across the street. And the owners and the staff all came over because they had to close down the shop after this whole event took place. And they came over, they bought us, they bought us our dinner, even though they already paid us for all the work we had done. And they were super happy. You bought dinner for like a dozen people that night or more. Yeah. And, uh, and as we were leaving, you know, the people had said thank you and they'd said good things and it was an enjoyable experience. But as we were leaving, they had like this huge, like standing ovation for us. Oh yeah. And, uh, that felt very good when, when you're able to show the work that you did, it's done. And then the people you made it for really love it and appreciate it. That makes this job way more fun than any other job in the world. So, um, yes, that was great. Know. I remember that. I remember that my wife came out. This is her here. And, uh, you know, she's always supportive of me when I'm doing crazy things like building R2D2. And I'm sure I tell her that I'm going to do these crazy things and she's probably got some level of skepticism. You know, I'm sure she'd hate to see me fail, but she never holds me back. And, uh, you know, so it was nice that they gave us that standing ovation and my wife was there and she got to see, hey, maybe my husband's not total screw up. So that was that was nice, uh, nice of them to do that. And this is your mom here. You can barely see her. That's true. But she's in all the other pictures, is too. She? I did want to mention also the when we premiered this oh, I found live, we also premiered it on Facebook. And we thought, you know, this is long form content. It really is not something people on Facebook are going to be that interested in. Well, we were wrong. People were very interested in yeah, this. Yeah, they were. People loved it. It went wild on Facebook. And this wasn't even meant to be an advertising piece. It was really for the enjoyment and to memorialize the shop and the relationship and, and all the things that went into um, Rod being where he is now and, and how he was involved with Bill and, and remembering Bill. And yet... This really took off. It resonated with a lot of people. So that was cool, too. And we were, I was surprised, very surprised. Did we actually do two showings, I, th I want to say? 
Did we I do think two? we did another one. Yeah, a little later because it wasn't that long, and people were going to be there for over an hour. So mm-hmm. we did another one. But needless to say, it was a success. We bit off a lot. We worked very hard, and we learned a lot. And I always take the uh, advice of Arnold Schwarzenegger and his motivational speeches: "says Don't be afraid to fail." We weren't afraid to fail, and we went into it. And uh, we did, you know, I don't think that we ever thought that we were going to completely fall on our face and not deliver anything, right? I mean, we knew that even if, you know, because we also did a shorter piece for him, advertising the shop. So we knew he'd at least get that. Yeah. And we knew that, you know, we'd put something together. But, you know, we we couldn't be uh, crippled by failure or fear of failure. So we went into it and we did it. Yeah. I mean, it's my opinion that if you aren't at least a little bit afraid – you're probably not doing something right. You got to do something that's going to push you out of your comfort zone. We didn't have to go into this business uh, for, you know, out of necessity. We both had, we were both gainfully employed when we decided to do this. I left a job and you left a job and we went into this, but you can take these kind of risks in life if you know, if you're, if you have that healthy fear, but you can never take them if you're too afraid to act and we weren't and we succeeded and uh, these these people that we did this for are very happy that we did um, because I don't know who else they would have went to in our area to do this. You know, who else would have done it, at least put in the work we did because of how dedicated we were to what we were doing. Yeah, no chance. I really don't know where else to go from here, Trevor. I think we laid it out. I think we hit all the points. I mean... Oh, I did want to mention one thing. We are entering this into a film festival, and I don't know. I mean, it's our first documentary, or as you call it, documentary, and and I don't know. We'll see how it does. If we win, that would be absolutely amazing, but I don't want to get my hopes up. We're talking about it on episode 10, but this is a long time ago to us now. This feels like, this feels like a long time ago to me, but really, it's not that long ago, but it feels like it's been a while. Trevor, I, th- I think I'd like to thank you for your dedication. Mm, I'd like to thank you. For your commitment. It's been a pleasure playing with you this evening. <laughs> Listen, all I want to know is if there's any cowboys in there, what are you going to do? Well, if there's any cowboys in there, I know their butts are going to drive you nuts. <laughs> um, all right. Do you want to, do you have any, uh, do you have any announcements for the, uh, for the podcast? Do you want to announce anything before we wrap this up? I just want to say, if you don't know, if you don't see what we're talking about, please check out the Check 2 Studios YouTube channel because you can see exactly what images we're referencing. That's right, man. Tell them about the YouTube channel. And I will try to include all the links to the actual documentary, the video itself, so you can watch it in all its entirety if you're interested in seeing the whole story after you've basically heard the elements of it, the arc that uh, was constructed and, and ultimately created. Um, hey man, tell them where they can get in on the discussion. Yeah, so you got to go into the Facebook group. We really want to start to engage. We want to hear from you. And our next 10 episodes, we want to and start to include your content. That's right, you out there. Well, this is news to me. Yeah, well. This is my platform. They can't. No. Are you sure? Listen. Okay. We just turn this on and, and you're the monkey that dances, okay? Uh, but where we're headed next... We built this platform from scratch to 150 need... subscribers. <laughs> wow. And you're just going to let them come in here yeah, and enjoy these riches, all these subscribers we got? Lo and behold, we might get to 160. No way. It'll never happen. Well, that's all that I have for tonight. What do you say? Trevor, if I have one thing to say, I think you should shoot first. Ask questions later. That's right. <laughs>